I believe uh, the subject that we are going to deal with and what uh, uh, Wildlife Works is pioneering is of such utmost importance that we can't possibly neglect it a single day. And I've uh, come from a part of the world where uh, there was very large-scale deforestation that took place soon after independence and even before that. Um, and more recently, <coughs> excuse me, I've been um, appointed as chairman of an organization in Guyana called the Ivokrama Trust. This is uh, a trust set up by the Commonwealth Secretariat and the government of Guyana, offering a million acres of rich rainforest to the international community essentially to develop it as a kind of a lab for sustainable management of these rainforest reserves. And uh, I frankly didn't know the complexity of the challenge in accepting uh, uh, the chair of this trust. And I now find I really have to make some major efforts and I'd probably rely on your advice um, to see how one might really make this a successful undertaking. I'm particularly pleased to see that you have business leaders and those associated with various walks of life because I think to deal with climate change would require the involvement of every stakeholder. Um, and certainly it's not merely an issue of corporate social responsibility for the corporate sector, but also getting familiar with and investing in understanding of a business opportunity that I believe will develop in the course of time once Red Plus really takes off as a major global undertaking. Um, and I think all of us are certainly part of society and therefore we owe it uh, to posterity and certainly to uh, the welfare of society in general to see that we do the little bit we can to deal with this major problem of climate change, which I will say a little more about. Uh, and to that extent, I believe that what a good friend of mine used to say is right on target. Uh, this was the former president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And he used to say, business cannot succeed in a society which fails. And we are clearly facing the possibility of failure of a number of human undertakings uh, as a result of the impacts of climate change. And therefore, I think it is important for us to work together. Now, let me start by um, uh, projecting my PowerPoint slides. Turn to the first one. We, in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, we made a very succinct, but I think significant statement. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. So in other words, it's beyond the range of doubt that the climate of the Earth is changing. Now, some will tell you that it's changing because of natural factors, but may I say that we made another very important statement which clearly disproves that fact because what we said was on the basis of um, observations. And we came up with uh, the statement that most of the warming which had taken place since the middle of the last century was very likely on account of increase in anthropogenic, that means human-induced concentration of greenhouse gases. And when we use the term very likely, we're attaching a probability of 90% or more. Now, I'd like to ask whether any business decision which requires action on the basis of outcomes that have a probability of over 90% would ever be neglected. I mean, businesses make investments of uh, commitment in terms of in investments, in terms of efforts, for probable outcomes much lower in terms of certainty than what I've just mentioned. And therefore, I think it is for us collectively as human society to decide that we have enough evidence on the basis of which we need to take action to deal with this problem. Now, here again, 
there's a significant fact which I thought I should bring to your attention. It was really 125,000 years ago that we had warming uh, for an extended period of time because after all you do have blips, you have heat waves which last a very short period of time. But I'm talking of uh, warming that took place for a reasonable period of time. And this was 125,000 years ago. What was the outcome? Well, we had sea level rise of over four to six meters. I'm sorry, the M has dropped off over there. And that clearly means that the geography of the planet was very different at that stage. We certainly don't want to be responsible, even in small measure, for bringing about a similar state of affairs over a period of time. And uh, this, you might ask, is... Um, how, how, you might ask the question, how is it that we can get this kind of information? Well, I've been to Greenland, where a lot of these ice cores are drilled. And you essentially go down deeper and deeper, and you are really uncovering uh, ice cores, which um, go back hundreds and thousands of years. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating science, because when you go a certain depth, you can easily tell the period of when that ice was formed, and within it are uh, pockets of air which are, which are trapped, so you analyze that. And there's a whole range of other factors also that can be analyzed, on the basis of which you can come up with indisputable conclusions on what really happened at that point of time. And Greenland, may I mention, just as an aside, is a fascinating place because it's the largest island on Earth, other than Australia, which is a continent. And it is full of ice, about three kilometers high. It's a mountain of ice. And wherever you look, you see nothing but ice. In fact, we went on a US Air Force plane, which doesn't land on wheels over there. It lands on skis. And therefore, uh, the ice has to be absolutely perfect for that kind of landing. And the plane that we went on actually couldn't take off for a while because it had just snowed and uh, the snow was rather soft at that stage. I'm only mentioning this to uh, bring out before you the fact that science has, advised to a, uh, has advanced to a point where to question the veracity, the reliability of what we come up with is really an insult to the body of knowledge that exists. Of course, one always welcomes debate, uh, because science and knowledge thrive on debate. But I think we should have an open mind to accept where we are left with very little doubt of the findings that science has provided to us. Now, just to quickly go through what uh, uh, observations tell us, if you go back in time to the beginning of industrialization, you get average surface temperature increase of the type that you see in the first figure over here. And you can see there are fluctuations. And those fluctuations are the result not only of human-induced climate change, but also natural factors like solar activity, volcanic activity, and so on. But what is very significant is the fact in the last 50 or 60 years, the trend is clearly upwards. And this is where uh, the Anthropocene age has set in. That means human beings are now dominating uh, changes in the climate with our actions. If you look at the second figure, that tells you about sea level rise, which is the result both of melting of the bodies of ice on, on, um, across the globe. And the, the very well put together film clearly showed you how the Arctic is melting. In fact, at the end of May, I'm going to be in the Arctic region again. And it's so palpable. It's so visible that you go there, even if you have an iota of doubt, you come back fully convinced because it's there before your eyes. You really can't mistake what is happening over there. However, in the 20th century, average sea level rise were, was about 17 centimeters. Perhaps being in San Francisco and in this beautiful area, you wouldn't be worry, worried about 17 centimeters. But if you are living in the Maldive Islands, where most of the 1,000-plus islands are barely a meter above sea level, then 17 centimeters is a lot. It's a big threat. 
because every time you have a storm surge, every time you have coastal flooding, somebody's life and property is at risk. In fact, I was first elected as vice chair of the IPCC in 1997, and the plenary session where this happened was in the Maldives. And the then president addressed us in the opening session, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the place where you're holding this meeting um, 10 years ago was under a foot and a half of water because you just had a massive lashing of the waves that filled that entire island with water. So you don't necessarily have to wait till the islands in the South Pacific and the Caribbean and other parts of the world get completely submerged by the sea. I think the threat, the danger to life and property begins well before that. The last uh, picture that you see is uh, Northern Hemisphere snow cover where you can see the trend is clearly downwards and it's taking place at a faster rate now. What I'll quickly run through this. What are the causes of change? Well, greenhouse gas emissions between 1970 and 2004, that's when the fourth assessment report of the IPCC uh, sort of completed its assessment of all the data that was available, have grown 70%. So in a sense, this seems an irony simply because the Framework Convention on Climate Change came into existence in 1992, but that's also a period when clearly there's been no impact on slowing down the emissions of greenhouse gases. And CO2 emissions have grown even faster at 80%. Now, as I said earlier, most of the observed increase in temperature since the mid-20th century is very likely, and that means a probability of an over 90% due to the increase in anthropogenic CO2 concentrations. Just to quickly tell you what are the sources from which we get these emissions, well, here you see the trend in the increases that have taken place, and I've already described uh, the total increase that took place in this time period, but there you see in the figure, the pie chart at the bottom, uh, the sources of emissions in which Clearly, the energy supply industry is very significant. Transport is important, industry, agriculture, and forestry. Uh, and forestry is something where, obviously, what is happening is largely because of the encroachment of human activities on this beautiful and natural habitat. And this clearly is a threat to... Um, not only the forests themselves, but all forms of life, including biodiversity, which is so precious, once replaced, will probably never come back. Um, I also want to mention that uh, there are parts of the globe which are extremely vulnerable. Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents, and therefore I'm delighted that you're working in Kenya. Uh, I had the privilege and... Uh, uh, the the affectionate experience of knowing Dr. Vangari Matai. I mean, she would call me brother and I would call her sister. And I think there is no place on earth as beautiful as that country, and we cannot possibly allow uh, the kind of ravages that are taking place in the forests of there as well as other parts of the world. Um, I also want to mention that there are substantial risks due to sea level rise, and this is particularly true of the Asian mega deltas. Which are these mega deltas? Well, the city of Shanghai, Dhaka in Bangladesh, uh, Kolkata in India, and also uh, the deltaic region of the Nile. So these are parts of the world where there's such a high concentration of population, there's so much of uh, the assets of human activities and uh, human efforts that are present, that every time there's a storm surge, the total cost of damage could be enormous. I mean, look at what Superstorm Sandy did. I mean, from what I've read in the media, the extent of damage was something like $52 billion. But remember, in the developing countries, these estimates really are a huge underestimate, simply because you don't have the insurance systems, you don't have means by which you might assess the economic impacts, and therefore it's a terrible understatement whenever you come up with a figure in terms of 
the losses and the damages that take place. Uh, I also want to highlight the fact that, you know, a lot of people can say that million, many millions of people are project, projected to be uh, flooded and therefore it doesn't bother me as long as I'm safe. We are living on one planet. And uh, when I had the privilege of accepting the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the IPCC, in my speech, I invoked a term that goes back literally thousands of years in India. And in Sanskrit, it says, Vasudev Kutumbukam. Uh, this was a world when there was no globalization. But this term means the universe is one family. And it's one family not just because of any kind of religious belief, but because there's a wisdom in accepting that fact. If there is devastation in any, in any part of the world, uh, just to give you an example, if uh, uh, in Somalia you have a complete breakdown of governance, what happens? Well, piracy takes over, and that's not going to leave anybody safe. We're living in a world where there are all kinds of threats which are illegal, and these, of course, are affected by, by shocks, by damage from extreme events. And therefore, I don't think anyone should live in the false belief that we are absolutely safe. I also want to mention that the most vulnerable industries, and I think this is where I go back to what Bjorn Stigson, my friend, used to say, business cannot succeed in a society which fails. The most uh, vulnerable are the ones that are going to be sensitive to temperature, hours of sunshine, precipitation, humidity, storm in intensity and frequency. I was uh, once at a dinner with uh, the chief executive of uh, Nestle, and he says we're very concerned about climate change because you know they deal with agricultural products, dairy products, and so on, and the impacts of climate change can be profound as far as these activities are concerned. Uh, we brought out a special report in 2011 on extreme events and disasters. And I want to just give you a few uh, messages from that report. Uh, there are changes in extreme events in the form of heavy precipitation becoming more frequent, more intense. Uh, warm, cold daily temperature extremes are taking place. Heat waves are on the increase. Sea level rise, certainly extreme sea level rise as a result of these extreme events can also pose a major threat. Now, here, what's said at the bottom in that caption is very important. We've estimated that some of the heat waves that currently take place once in 20 years will, by the end of the century, take place once in two years. For those of you who know about the terrible tragedy that took place in Europe in 2003, mainly in Paris and around Paris, but in other parts of the the continent as well, uh, saw as a result of that heat wave, the massive heat wave that came about, something like 40,000 plus deaths <coughs> occurring. So this is something that obviously is not going to leave anybody untouched because these heat waves we have found are increasing in frequency and intensity across the globe. Um, we also know that some parts of the world are far more vulnerable than others. If you look at the estimate of uh, deaths that have taken place between 1970 and 2008 from all kinds of disasters, this is not climate-related disasters, but all kinds of disasters, 95% uh, have occurred in the developing countries, 5% in the developed world. And I think that's because you just don't have the early warning systems, you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the means by which life and property can be protected in the developing countries. In the country of Myanmar, in the year 2008, there was this massive cyclone called Nargis, as a result of which 140,000 uh, people lost their lives. Their homes were completely destroyed because these are very flimsy dwellings. And therefore, I think we need to be sensitive to the fact that in an unequal world, Unfortunately, the impacts of climate change are also unequal. They are far more severe in th on those who are least responsible for having brought about this situation to start with. I also want to highlight some abrupt and irreversible changes that are possible. 
Uh, one could be partial loss of ice sheets, <coughs> which can lead to meters of sea level rise. And that, once again, as I said earlier, could change the geography of this planet. We also assess that 20 to 30 percent of the species are likely to be at the risk of extinction if increases in warming exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. So quite apart from the impacts of logging and illegal felling of trees, uh, there is also the impact of climate change, which can pose a major th threat to biodiversity because this 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius is not something that's improbable with the trends that we see in existence today. And if we have this <clears throat> massive threat to 25 to 30 percent of the species, then you can imagine this is something which is totally irreplaceable. Uh, the meridian, meridional uh, overturning circulation, which is what you might call the Gulf Stream, which keeps a good part of Europe warmer than it would have been normally, is also going to be affected. Of course, in this century, <coughs> there is no danger of it breaking down in any way, but it could change in a manner that marine life could be affected. Now, the reality is that neither adaptation nor mitigation alone can avoid all climate change impacts. However, if they complement each other, and together they can together significantly reduce the risks of climate change. You know, some will tell you the world can adapt to this rate of climate change. Now, nothing could be further from reality. The truth is there are limits to adaptation. You could reach tipping points or benchmarks beyond which it would become very, very difficult to adapt. Some even go to the extent of saying, why worry about a few small islands? Those people, a few hundred thousand people, can easily be moved elsewhere and resettled in other locations. Now, that, to my mind, is a very cynical view because you're forgetting the fact that these are cultures which are rooted where their great-grandfathers, their grandfathers' bones are buried. They have a long history and tradition of human existence which you have to value. You can't dismiss that, because if you do, then clearly uh, that's a very mechanical treatment of an intensely human problem. Uh, there is, of course, fortunately, enormous potential for the mitigation of global greenhouse gas emissions. And may I highlight red as an extremely important part, because this is something, theoretically at least, uh, can be done in a very short period of time. because. Red is taking place uh, in against the challenge of um, a breakdown of governance, a breakdown of uh, of uh, an assessment of the impacts of uh, cutting of trees, and therefore this uh, deforestation and degradation is something that clearly, if uh, mounted effectively, can give you pretty quick and uh, large-scale results. Now, here I just want to highlight another important fact, and this, of course, is very true in the case of red projects. Uh, one is often told that, you know, mitigation would be an extremely expensive proposition and would slow down the growth and the good things in life that we have become accustomed to. Well, the reality is very different. We have carried out a very clear assessment of all the options in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, and we find that if we were to embark on a path of stringent mitigation, then in 2030, what would happen is that it would cost no more than 3% of the global GDP to mitigate at the required level. And that really means that the so-called level of prosperity that um, the world would reach in 2030 would at best be postponed by a few months or a year. Now, that clearly isn't a major uh, cost at all if you can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Now here, this gives you sector by sector uh, the potential that exists in different uh, s uh, sectors of the economy, and forestry is quite significant. Um, I also want to mention that mitigation carries a whole range of health co-benefits. If you refer specifically to Red Plus, then clearly there are huge benefits to uh, the society that's surrounding these forests and much beyond. 
Uh, there's higher energy security, health co-benefits because of reduced pollution at the local level, more rural employment, uh, increased agricultural production, and so on. Now, in the case of Red Plus, uh, this is a financial instrument to incentivize conservation and sustainable management of forests, and thereby reduce GHG emissions. You'll be talking about this all through the day, so I'm not going to get into this issue at all. Uh, but may I also highlight the fact that there would be a need to bring about change in attitudes and uh, lifestyles. Uh, and I want to give you a quote from Mahatma Gandhi when he was asked by, I think, a British journalist, Mr. Gandhi, wouldn't you want India to reach the same level of prosperity at, as Britain? Uh, he said, well, it took uh, Britain to use, the half, to use half the resources of this planet to reach its level of prosperity. How many planets would a country like India require? So, you know, the fact is that we also have to change our lifestyle. We saw in that beautiful picture the huge logs that are being carted off. And I, I think if there was proper demand management, if there was substitution for resources that are used on a sustainable basis, then some of the, the massive destruction that is taking place could certainly be arrested. And let me end by uh, another quote from Gandhi. And you know, I know dozens of them, but I'm not going to <laughs> overload you with uh, all of these. He also said, if I, it's not written here, but may I say so. He said, speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> And I think that's particularly important when you're talking about GDP as a measure of human welfare. GDP is, of course, a very neat and convenient measure to uh, evaluate the level of economic activity. But uh, if anyone says that's a clear reflection of uh, human welfare, then we're missing something out. But this is something that we need to keep in mind, particularly in the context of RED. We may utilize the gifts of nature just as we choose. But in her books, the debts are always equal to the credits. So they, uh, when, when I started my graduate work, the first book I read, and you know that's how I decided to go into economics from engineering, was something called, it had the title Tan Staffel, uh, which meant there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And I think nature tells us that very clearly. Thank you very much.